Okay, well, let's take a look at the two-layer critical refraction problem now. Um, we have um, three layers, actually. Um, the bottom of the third layer isn't shown. It's not relevant to the problem, but we have uh, uh, these three layers with velocities v1, v2, and v3, and we're dealing with a special case here where v1 is less than v2, is less than v3, so we have Velocity is increasing with, uh, with, with depth from layer to layer. Uh, the layer thicknesses here are H1 and H2. They are, don't have to be similar in thickness to each other. They just, uh, just kind of drawn them that way. But we know that the source generates a mechanical disturbance, which uh, propagates down into the subsurface uh, in all directions. And, here we're looking at uh, just one ray path. Remember the ray paths are propagation paths that are drawn normal to the uh, to the wavefront. So this is just one one ray path in that expanding wavefront. Uh, that ray path comes down. It refracts uh, uh, over into layer two at an angle theta two greater than theta one because uh, v two is greater than v one. And when it hits the interface between layers two and three, again, it refracts, and theta three is greater than theta two. Now we know that at some point, um, the, the ray path going down through layer two will strike the interface between layers two and three at an angle which will cause the refracted ray to refract at an angle of pi over 2 and uh, continue basically right out along the interface between these uh, two media, between the media 2 and 3. And it will travel with a velocity v3. Now we remember from uh, you know the general form of Snell's law, sine theta 1 over v1 is equal to sine theta 2 over v2 is equal to sine theta 3 over v3 and, and so on. And we're going to use that uh, relationship here in a few minutes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> right now we're just uh, stating the obvious here that time is equal to distance traveled over velocity. So the first thing that we might want to do is determine what the total distance uh, traveled is. And we can see that this path goes down, it comes up over here, it has a length d1. If the velocity is constant in this layer, then the length of the downgoing path and the length of the upgoing paths are going to be equal, equal to d1. So we have 2 times d1 here. Likewise, the length of the path going down and up in layer 2 is going to be equal to d2. So we have uh, 2 times d2, or we could just say 2 times d1 plus d2, since uh, that's going to give us twice the distance going down, uh, which will give us the distance going down and the total distance going up. Uh, we also have this segment uh, between these two incident points, uh, which has a distance which is equal to the total source receiver distance minus two times the projections of these paths onto each of the interface which are L1 in this case, and L2 in this case, and would also be L1 over here, and L2 over here. So again, we have this, uh, except we're subtracting it from the total distance, so this is minus 2L1 plus L2. So we have a wavefront that travels along three different segments uh, at three different velocities. Uh, this is the distance, we could refer to this distance as the distance along the slant path, and this distance as the distance along the interface, that's uh, this distance here, and the slant path distances are just twice this uh, sum. And if we look at D1 and ask ourselves what is D1, D1 is just going to be H1, the thickness of the layer, divided by the cosine of theta1. Uh, we know cosine of theta1 is just going to be equal to the side adjacent over the hypotenuse, so cosine of theta1 is equal to h1 over d1. Similarly, d2 will just be equal to h2 divided by cosine of theta critical, and that's this particular theta critical, the uh, angle that the ray path makes with the vertical 
in layer two, producing a refraction angle of pi over two. Um, with this uh, ray traveling with a velocity v3. Now, similarly, we have the these distances, uh, L1 and L2, which are basically the projections of the ray path onto the interface. And we know that this uh, projection in the case of L, L1 would be H1 times the tangent of theta 1. You know, tangent of theta 1 is just uh, L1, the side opposite, over H1, the side adjacent. So we have uh, L1 equal to H1 tan theta 1. And similarly, we have L2 equal to H2 tangent of theta 2. And we know that this uh, total distance along the uh, interface, the, the length of the ray path along the interface, is just the source receiver distance minus 2 times L1 plus L2. So we have all these we have all these terms. We just we're just substituting now for d1, d2. We've got two times h1 over cosine theta one plus h1 over cosine two theta critical um, plus x. This is the total source receiver distance minus two times h1 tangent of theta one plus h2 tangent of theta two theta two critical in this case. So we have the uh, total path length, and we know that the travel time is just going to be equal to the distance uh, divided by the velocity. And, and we realize that the uh, paths that the wavefront travels along uh, uh, cause the wavefront to travel at three different velocities. So uh, the wavefront travels the distance d1 with velocity v1, d2 with velocity v2, and along the interface, uh, beyond, uh, again, we have this minimum distance. The distance uh, uh, for offset distance is less than x min. We don't see a critical refraction. Uh, but beyond x min, we know that the uh, path uh, length would be equal to 2 times L1 plus L2. And that along that path, the wavefront will be traveling with a velocity v3. So the total critical refraction time, the, the travel time as a function of x for the critical refraction from the base of layer 2, the top of layer 3, is 2 times d1, the down upgoing paths over the velocity in the upper medium, v1, plus 2 times d2 over v2 plus x minus 2l1 minus 2l2, uh, the path along the interface where we are traveling with a velocity v3. So we have uh, just rearranging terms. Um, and uh, you know, looking at our substitutions, we have making our substitutions for d1 and d2 and l1 and l2. Uh, we can then rearrange it. You know, keeping the velocities, and then we're talking about the critical refraction travel time. So we got the velocities in there, we've got the distances. Um, we do some rearrangement. We take our x over here. We have x over v3, so we've got a function of x here. And then all these terms are just constants. Uh, h1 and h2 are constant, v1, v2, v3 are constant, uh, cosine theta 1, theta 2 critical, are uh, constants. So we basically have a relationship which again is a straight line. We have um, some function of x here plus a constant. And this function of x here is linear in x. It has slope equal to 1 over v3. So uh, again, we're taking advantage of Snell's law in its general form. Uh, sine theta 1 over v1 is equal to sine theta 2 over v2, and so on out to sine theta n over v sub n. Uh, the particular case that we're interested in is uh, this uh, three-layer case where we have sine theta 1 over v1 is equal to sine theta 2 over v2 is equal to 1 over v3 at the critical angle. So uh, 
as we did with the single layer refraction uh, problem, your problem this time is, is once again to eliminate the trigonometric functions from, um, from, this, uh, from this expression. And um, so you'll want to remember we can construct uh, triangles here from these uh, Snell law uh, relationships. Uh, construct the appropriate triangles, eliminate the theta terms uh, to obtain the intercept in terms of h1, h2, v1, v2, and v3. And that should do it for today. What uh, you should try to do is, and let me just back up a little bit here, is rearrange this uh, expression, come up with those uh, triangular relationships between uh, uh, for the different trigonometric functions for theta 1, theta 2, and uh, eliminate them from, the, uh, from that equation. And uh, express the critical refraction time then as a function only of h1, h2, v1, v2, and v3. So uh, again, thanks for joining us and uh, see you next time.